Okay, welcome again, and uh, thank you for taking your seats. It's good to see you. And uh, so, good evening, and welcome to uh, McCormick Lounge and Loyola University of Chicago, uh, located here on the banks of the majestic Lake Michigan, on a on a superb uh, almost summer day. And so, um, really, really happy for this perfect day. And there's nothing so beautiful as spring. Um, so, a heartfelt welcome to you in the room here, um, but also to our friends on live stream, where we have almost a thousand registrations for this talk. And that's our new reality. So, you know, I say props to people here in the, in, in the flesh too, all right? Uh, so welcome one and all and, and happy Easter to you. Uh, my name is Michael Murphy and I direct the Hank Center here at Loyola. And on behalf of Joan and Bill Hank, whose generous endowment uh, fires our many endeavors, um, you know, I, I welcome you uh, from them. They always, and hopefully they're on the live stream. I, my guess is they probably are. Um, but also on behalf of our center manager, Katie Arnold, and our graduate assistant, Adam High, who's uh, helping on the Zoom, and then our undergrad assistants, um, Connor and Grace and Matt, we want to uh, add a, another level of welcome from the Hank Center. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, you know, I'm glad you're here for the seventh annual Cardinal Bernadine Common Cause Lecture, which is the common good and synodality, the vision of Pope Francis with Bishop John Stowe of the Diocese of Lexington, Kentucky. I'm so pleased to see such a broad turnout today. I see, I see many students. I'm so glad to see you students. I'm glad you're here. We're glad you're here. I see uh, scholastics. I see our friends from the Jesuit community. I see our friends in leadership from the Archdiocese. Thank you, Bishop Birmingham, for being here. I see loyal leadership. I see uh, our neighbors and our staff and our faculty, honored guests all. Thanks for being here. Um, I also want to give a special welcome to uh, our rector of our Jesuit community, Father Richie Salmi, who's co-hosting this event. So thank you. And also to our university president, Dr. Mark Reed, who will be introducing our speaker in a moment and providing his personal welcome. You know, Cardinal Blaise Supich inaugurated this lecture series in 2017 with a trenchant and life-giving piece called, quote, Science of the Times, Witnessing to a Consistent Ethic of Solidarity. Bishop uh, Robert McElroy, who's now a cardinal, followed one year later with the most timely and challenging talk, he called it, Forming a Catholic Political Imagination. Both of these lectures are available on our Hank Center YouTube channel, as well as the other uh, four. <laughs> sure thing, says my watch. Thank you very much. Well, I'll be talking to you later. Um, anyway, all these encroachments of technology. Um, but these are all, they're available there, and they're all also published by Common Wheel, which uh, highlights another relationship. I want to welcome you, Dominic Preziosi, the editor of Common Wheel, who has published every Bernadine lecture since our, our first one. So good to see you tonight, Dominic. Always a pleasure to work with you. Uh, yeah, thanks. Thank you. Yeah, great work. Um, so uh, it's now 40 years since uh, uh, the Fordham University talk uh, given by uh, the late Joseph Cardinal Bernadine of Chicago, uh, the talk that inspires our series, a lecture that calls us to serious engagement with the Catholic intellectual tradition and the humanitarian demands of Catholic social thought and teaching. A lecture that calls us again today to account for the whole, which is probably the best translation of the word Catholic, accounting for the whole. Uh, a lecture that calls us today with renewed and dramatic vigor. Cardinal Bernardino entitled his 1983 talk, A Consistent Eth Ethic of Life, an American Catholic Dialogue. And it was bold. It was, of course, also prophetic in that Cardinal Bernadine located and decried trends in culture that are now, unfortunately, in fuller bloom. Division and polarization in so many human communities, uh, the church in the US being one such community, alas. But I say, in the interest of spring, there is, as Hopkins might say, the dearest freshness deep down things. That in this tension, something positive can come out of it. That is my hope. And you know, history can tell us that story, too. So what's the way forward? We all wonder together after a set of very difficult years. And I think in some way, Bishop Stowe will, will help us think about that, especially as he kind of frames his reading, his experiences that are deep with uh, the synodal process, 
And so we look forward to Bishop Stowe's insights. One note for our Zoomsters, um, before I pass the torch to Dr. Reed, uh, our Rambler Productions is in charge tonight. Thank you for being here, Rambler Productions. Uh, and they're engineering the Zoomcast. So uh, Zoom folks, feel free to just click on that Q&A. You know the, the drill. And we will field as many of your questions as we can remotely and integrate them into our, um, our event here. So now it's my distinct honor to, uh, to introduce our, our Loyola University of Chicago president, Dr. Mark Reed. Good evening to you, Dr. Reed, and welcome. Thank you, Dr. Murphy, for your introduction, and welcome, of course, to Bishop John Stowe. Welcome to Loyola University Chicago. It always is this nice <laughs> along the lake. <laughs> welcome, everyone, to Loyola and to the Joan and Bill Hank Center for the Catholic Intellectual Heritage. The Hank Center, of course, serves as an indispensable role at Loyola as custodian of our Catholic intellectual and cultural legacy. Universities grew from the heart of the church. They were founded to serve the church, and they have helped bridge faith and inquiry and embrace empirical science as part of the quest for truth. Cardinal Joseph Bernadine, for whom this annual lecture is named, was known for his embrace of a theology of an inclusive, both and instead of the alternative, either or. Our Bernadine lecturer this year, Bishop John Stowe, explores a subject much in the Catholic conversation these days. That is the central role of synodality in the papacy of Francis. Synodality, which literally means walking together, has been present in Christianity since its very beginning. It is not simply about involving people in decision making, but rather about involving all the baptized in discerning God's will and listening to the Holy Spirit. Pope Francis makes the tent even larger by seeking dialogue with all people of goodwill. And this approach to synodality among the bishops encourages dialogue and perhaps even arguments over issues that the church faces. Pope Francis strongly believes in listening to people before speaking on behalf of the universal church. And so we are honored to welcome this year's Bernadine lecturer, Bishop John Stowe, a person who is uniquely positioned in experience and background to explore this topic. Born and raised in Ohio, Bishop Stowe entered the Franciscan order soon after high school. Yet I can't help but note that he is Jesuit educated. <laughs> While in Franciscan formation at St. Bonaventure Friary in St. Louis, he earned his undergraduate degrees in history and philosophy from St. Louis University. And then he would go on to graduate degrees in divinity and church history from the Jesuit School of Theology, now at Santa Clara University. Ordained in 1995, Bishop Stowe served for many years in El Paso, Texas, as a parish priest, vicar general, and then chancellor of the diocese. And in 2015, Pope Francis appointed him as bishop of Lexington, Kentucky. Bishop Stowe has served as Bishop President of Pax Christi USA since 2018. Pax Christi USA has a rich legacy of advocating for peacemaking, economic and racial justice, and human rights. And all are issues that are dear to Bishop Stowe as a Franciscan and central to his practice as a priest and bishop. And much like Cardinal Bernadine, Bishop Stowe practices an ethic of inclusivity, reconciliation, and justice. These virtues are central in his pastoral care and leadership and go a long way to explaining why he has been elevated to leadership in the Franciscans and why Pope Francis elevated him as bishop. Please join me in welcoming Bishop John Stowe. Thank you, Dr. Reed, and thank you, Dr. Murphy, for those generous introductions. Very happy to be with you this evening. Very honored to give this lecture. 
In the evening of October 11th, 1962, the night preceding the opening of the Second Vatican Council, a crowd of mostly young people filled St. Peter's Square with plenty of energy, enthusiasm, and expectation for what was about to unfold. St. John the 23rd came to the window from which popes customarily addressed the crowds at the Sunday Angelus and gave an impromptu fervorino, referred to simply as the moonlight speech. It's probably his best remembered speech and certainly provides an apt characterization of the man known to the world as good Pope John. After rejoicing to see the whole world converge at St. Peter's, with the glow of their candles creating quite an impressive scene, Pope John mused that even the moon came out for that event. After a few more words of encouragement, he said, when you go home, give your children a hug and tell them it's from the Pope. And when you find them with tears to dry, give them a good word. Give anyone who suffers a word of comfort. Tell them the Pope is with us, especially in our times of sadness. I begin with this snapshot because in October of 2012, there was a commemoration of the 50th anniversary of the council's opening and an attempt to recreate that nighttime scene, albeit with a very different Pope in that window. But reflecting on the heartfelt and simple words of Pope John, I thought at that time, imagine having a Pope who speaks like that. And just five months later, we did. We just witnessed the completion of a decade of the Francis Papacy. And before going into a reflection on the vision and direction he's provided for the church in these eventful 10 years, I would like just to pause and give thanks to God that we again have a Pope whose smile has enchanted the whole world, whose actions and gestures speak even more loudly than his powerful words, and who's calling the church back to the fundamentals of the gospel, or as he puts it, the joy of the gospel. St. John the 23rd called for a giornamento so that the worldwide church could be refreshed and renewed for its mission in the world. His fifth successor, Pope Francis, is convinced that it was the Holy Spirit's actions that made the council bear fruit. And he's making it crystal clear now that the Second Vatican Council has charted the course for the church that he intends to follow. Like his smiling predecessor, Francis is attuned to the realities of the suffering of the innocent and is painfully aware of how inequality of access to the world's goods and the phenomenal disproportionality in the consumption of those goods contributes to the violence, instability, and threatened future of humanity. But it doesn't have to be so, he reminds us again and again. And the remedy is to simply live as sisters and brothers as God's plan has designed. The aggiornamento needed for the present moment is to get back on course with the pilgrim people of God ecclesiology of the council and to forge even stronger bonds of fraternity, not only with other Christians, but with all the world's religions and even those of no faith who would be characterized as people of goodwill. Pope Francis is leading the way sometimes even from a wheelchair. In the past few weeks, there have been many assessments of the Bergoglio papacy up to this point, and not surprisingly, a variety of viewpoints, either lauding its fruitfulness or bemoaning the lack thereof. If one's primary concern about the church today is access to the preconciliar liturgy, or preconciliar attitudes about ecumenism and interreligious dialogue, or a rigid interpretation of the church's moral tradition when it comes to sexual ethics, but not to social ethics, if one fears a church in dialogue with the world, or fears a hierarchy that, listen to its own, that listens to its own flock, if one wants to be certain that the sacraments be exclusively offered to the saintly, 
or fears any greater inclusion of laity, especially women, in co-responsible roles in the church, then the Francis pontificate has been an outright disaster. That is supposedly how a cardinal, once a close collaborator of Francis, described this decade in a posthumous posthumously released commentary. If, however, on the other hand, one has been inspired when a bishop of Rome was selected by the cardinals from the ends of the world, from Argentina, one who chose the name of Francis in remembrance of the saint of the poor, of creation, and of peace, if one is grateful for relief from the imposition of Tridentine rubrics and preconciliar liturgical fashion by young clerics, if one is enthused by the reintroduction and reimagination of synodality in the West, if one prefers a pope who washes the feet of women, Muslims, prisoners, and who brings refugees on board papal flights and invites them to live in the Vatican, if one nods in agreement with the idea that the church is supposed to form consciences and not replace them, and if one rejoices to see accompaniment, accompaniment and discernment as the proper approach toward those whose lives are not fully reflective of the church's teachings, then it's hard to consider these 10 years as anything but a successful beginning. In the aftermath of his election, the world could not seem to get enough news about the pope who got on the bus with his fellow cardinals instead of a papal limousine, who paid his own hotel bill in person after the conclave, who celebrated mass in the parish church of the Vatican and greeted the people after mass like any pastor, and who found the apostolic palace, home to his predecessors for centuries, to be too big while the doorway was too narrow and so opted to continue to live in the hotel created for the conclave, where he eats in its cafeteria and regularly celebrates mass in its chapel. The Pope who made his first apostolic voyage to the small Italian island of Lampedusa, the site of the drowning deaths of many migrants fleeing tragic circumstances in Africa, where he celebrated mass on an altar made of the wood of one of the wrecked ships whose passengers perished. A cardinal archbishop who was, was once known to avoid the press and to be rather reserved in Buenos Aires was now radiating the joy of the gospel and providing visual images to a worldwide feed revealing the gospel in action. I and many others would ask, what's not to like? But of course I already answered that question. No pope should be remembered for only one thing. But it seems that recent popes have each introduced a memorable word or phrase into the Catholic lexicon. For John XXIII, it was aggiornamento. For Paul VI, it was evangelization. For John Paul II, the word solidarity probably takes first place. And for Benedict XVI, it was the rejection of relativism. For a good while, I was convinced that the Francis word would be periphery. Was anybody talking about the peripheries before 2013? It shouldn't be surprising from the first Latin American Pope who brings with him the legacy of Selim, the Latin American Bishops Conference, and its aim to create missionary disciples, the same conference which de declared a preferential option for the poor and aligned itself with the impoverished masses of the continent after centuries of being part of the privileged elite. The peripheries to which Father Jorge once sent his Jesuit novices has now become a worldwide directive of mission from the center of the church. The word joy is also a contender, although certainly not coined by Francis. When had we ever heard so much about the joy of the gospel? The joy of love, especially married and family love. The joy of the call of holiness. Certainly more far-reaching than any of his encyclicals is the very joy that he so obviously expresses with every encounter with refugees, migrants, the imprisoned, those who dwell in ghettos, the hospitalized, and those in nursing homes. 
Recently, after seeing so many pictures of the Pope in discomfort and awkwardly moving around, I wondered if we'd see that smile again. But sure enough, on Holy Thursday, at the Marmo Juvenile Detention Center where he washed the feet of inmates, I saw that beaming smile, which was returned to him by those who experienced that intimate connection of the foot washing. The joy of the gospel was the title of his first apostolic exhortation and really served as a programmatic essay about how his papacy would unfold and his direction for leading the church. Christopher Lamb, who writes for the British journal The Tablet, summarizes France's decade in five words, missionary, synodal, disruptor, fraternity, and pastoral. Now my hope in prayer is that synodality becomes the lasting Franciscan contribution to our Catholic vocabulary. This Pope, who is a man of deep prayer, who is schooled in the Ignatian spiritual tradition of discernment, who bears witness to the freedom of the Holy Spirit, is content to convene the bishops and the whole people of God to learn again to walk together, which he reminds us is the foundational meaning of synod. It's also a phrase used by St. John the 23rd in that moonlight speech. Tutti insieme in fraternita, everyone together in fraternity towards peace. Pope Francis is also reformulating the use of synods so that they're not only periodic events for convening bishops in affective collegiality, but that they become the new way of being the church at every level. If this attempt is successful, its impact will be comparable to that of the Second Vatican Council, opened by another pope seen to be nearing the end of his days. Francis builds on the legacy of the Second Vatican Council's restoration of the Synod of Bishops as a permanent reality in the church. Lumen Gentium provided a renewed look at the traditional ministry of the bishop. The council restored the office of diocesan bishop as being much more than a branch officer for the corporate office in Rome. The council also discussed the collegiality necessary among all bishops who share responsibility for the universal church with Peter and under Peter. Still, there was no intermediary structure between the local bishop and pope except for the national and regional conferences of bishops, which are more about fraternal collegiality than effective governance, and the synod of bishops, which would be convened by the pope, discuss pertinent, issue, pertinent issues at the pope's request, and provide a global perspective to the pope. Pope Francis himself, as a bishop, did not appreciate synods that seemed to merely rubber stamp decisions and directives made elsewhere mainly by the Roman Curia. He lamented his own experience of bishops sharing opinions and critiques outside the Synod Hall who had been much more reserved about doing so in the Holy Father's presence. At his first Synod as Bishop of Rome, the extraordinary Synod on the family, Francis instructed the participating bishops to speak boldly and listen charitably. It seems that some were better at implementing the first half of the directive. Another of the frequently repeated words in the Francis lexicon is parisia, or boldness, which he insists is necessary in the synodal process if real discernment, listening, and dialogue is to take place. The Acts of the Apostles describe such parisia among the disciples. But in the synodal setting, time for silence, prayer, processing, and discernment are just as important. The recent phase, the recent diocesan phase of the Universal Synod on Synodality was meant to be an exercise in teaching this method to the whole church. Indeed, it was a start, but there's a long way to go. Francis has clarified that synods are not to function in a parliamentary fashion, 
There are no parties. And it's not simply a matter of arguing or winning the majority to one side of an argument. Real synodality should not have winners and losers. If people are not open to a change of heart through dialogue, they have yet to learn the synodal method. Now, Francis is not at all afraid of learning from failures and trying repeatedly to get it right. Many across the ideological spectrum, for example, would consider the Amazon Synod to have been a failure. Some because it did not result in the ordination of married deacons to the priesthood, nor women to the diaconate. Others because of their horror that such issues even came to the floor. In his discernment after the event, Pope Francis said that it was not the moment to act on such proposals because everyone came with their preconceived views on the topics, and none of the participants was really open to change. If we consider the current synod on synodality and pay particular attention to its implementation in the United States up until now, we can see both an initial grasp of the concept of synodality, along with an enthusiasm for the process of listening and consultation but also a well-found weariness and wariness about whether anything will come of it. I'm referring here to the laity primarily. There are also critiques of the process, suspicions of its agenda, and attempts to discredit it. Reception by the bishops in the United States can be characterized as lukewarm at best. There are places in our country where the synod has been embraced and eagerly implemented, and places where there has been little to no engagement with the process. My perspective here is shaped by having been the bishop from my region, that is the ecclesiastical provinces of Louisville, Mobile, and New Orleans, to coordinate our regional synthesis, and also as a part of the USCCB team to coordinate the national synthesis and participate in the drafting of the continental synthesis. While every diocese in my region did something, some were content to merely offer an online survey. Now, an online survey can be helpful, can be a useful tool, especially when there was a desire to include the disaffected and the alienated, who would probably not be inclined to come to a church gathering for this purpose but an online tool alone can hardly be an expression of the walking together that the synod is supposed to be about. The dominant cultural pragmatism in North America was evident in the desire to know where this is going. Bishops frequently stated that they do not know how to lead a process when the desired outcome of that process is unclear. I think the Pope's response to that complaint would be that the bishops are not meant to lead the process, but to facilitate the Holy Spirit's guidance. It's easy to see why the National Eucharistic Revival has received far more energy, attention, and resources in the US church. There's a plan, there's marketing, there's a beginning and end point, there's substantial funding, there's a problem to be addressed, namely the concern that Catholics do not believe sufficiently in the real presence. But instead of insisting and ensuring that there was a Eucharistic centrality to the synodal process, allowing for an organic discernment about our Eucharistic understanding, plans for a mega event featuring plenty of preconciliar piety and theology has replaced the focus on the synod for a synodal church in the USCCB. It doesn't strike me as coincidental that much of the Eucharistic revival focuses on Eucharistic adoration, passive in nature, and so offers an easy alternative to the active engagement of walking together synodally. Several places in the United States could not resist creating a local action plan for their synod even though this is clearly not the stage of the synod for that. 
Now, sometimes that plan, that desire or push for a plan was so that the insights gleaned from the people of God in dialogue would not be lost. I think that concern is valid, but also comes from a thinking that the synod is an event rather than the way of being church. So the first phase of the synod from October 2021 until April 2022 was to be the phase for listening and discernment in local churches, in dioceses, and bishops' conferences. The national synthesis of the people of God in the United States of America for the diocesan phase, that's a document for the diocesan phase of the synod, emphasizes the joy with which participants were engaged and the positive feelings that came from the listening sessions. The structure and facilitation of such sessions varied greatly but this was not seen as problematic by the office of the Synod in Rome because the church is diverse. And this, was, this phase was not to be a one-time opportunity to get it right, but rather the beginning of an evolving process. The number of people who expressed gratitude to be listened to, some saying for the first time, or to have the opportunity to express themselves was very impressive even if some of those who wish to discount the process prefer to emphasize the minuscule percentage of all Catholics who actually participated in a formal session. My own experience of sensing a palpable love for the church, even when members have been frustrated, hurt, and are worried about its future, was echoed throughout the country and around the globe. The enduring wounds of the sexual abuse and mismanagement crisis was prominent in discussions, and related issues as to the concentration of power among clerics, loss of respect and trust in the hierarchy, and fear about the faith not being received by the next generations were also omnipresent. So were concerns about the role of women in the church and the place of LGBTQ persons in the church. There was a great desire expressed to be a more welcoming church and to offer accompaniment to people at every stage of faith development. It seems that those who are engaged in synodal processes throughout the country have come to appreciate the language and the spirit of Pope Francis and really are learning the art of discernment. It should be noted also that many groups conducted synodal listening sessions outside of diocesan or parish structures and sent their syntheses directly to the synod office in Rome or directly to the bishop's conference, sometimes expressing dissatisfaction with their local process. Even so, the concerns which were prominent throughout the United States also surfaced in many parts of the world. If Pope Francis was hopeful that the spirit would provide the issues to be discerned, the spirit is indeed speaking. When all of these national syntheses were received in Rome, a working document was created there, and the title given by the office of the synod in Rome to the working document for the continental stage reveals this spirit. It's called Enlarge the Space of Your Tent, from Isaiah 54, 2. This title reflects a desire for a less self-enclosed and a more welcoming church, something that was echoed throughout the world. The Continental Document describes a kind of wrestling with the concept of synodality. It's not yet a household word. We're not yet really sure how it's to be done. There's a wrestling with the process, and it also reflects a real desire for a more missionary church, even if we're not sure how to get there. The working document was for the continental phase was then sent back to the dioceses for further discussion, careful reading, reflection, and discernment in dialogue. All of the synodal process is meant to go back and forth from the church and the universal church in Rome to the local churches. All were asked in each of their dioceses to describe what in the document resonated in their experience and what would be most impactful to their local church. 
These discussions were meant to be preparatory for a continental synodal assembly, which did happen on every continent except North America. For the purposes of this phase of the synod, Mexico was included with Latin America, South and Central America, because of linguistic, cultural, and historical ties. North America then, the US and Canada, conducted several sessions by Zoom with the bishops and the delegates selected by each diocesan bishop. There were sessions available in English, Spanish, and French. Now Asia, Europe, and Africa, with their vast geographies and cultural diversity, were able to conduct continental assemblies in person. Even the Middle East created such an assembly. North America did not citing economic and practical difficulties in coming together. In this stage, with a more narrow selection of delegates, there were some notable differences from the broad content heard in the diocesan listening sessions. Concerns about the direction of the synod were more pronounced. Many raised questions about whether the synod was trying to change doctrine and voiced opposition to that possibility calls for greater precision in what inclusivity might mean and who it might involve were more common. Discussion of liturgical tensions and the loss of access to the Latin mass, as well as laments about confusion in the process were more vocal at this stage. The USCCB Synod staff noted the low participation of priests in the synod process and asked each bishop then to appoint one older and one more recently ordained priest to a special clerical session also conducted by Zoom. Those concerns I just mentioned dominated that session even more, but it was deemed unofficial and similar to a special session created for ecumenical leaders, which I personally found very illuminating, did not factor into the continental synthesis, which was submitted to Rome and awaits publication. Another aspect of synodality that I do not believe gets sufficient attention is the ecumenical incentive, especially concerning relationships with the East. In 2008, well before the election of Pope Francis, his good friend, the ecumenical patriarch Bartholomew, the first patriarch of Constant Constantinople to attend a papal installation, spoke to the Synod of Bishops precisely on the issue of synodality. His speech was, in his own words, a response to St. John Paul II's 1995 encyclical, Ut Unim Sint, in which he basically asked the larger Christian community for ways to reimagine the Petrine ministry in a church healed of schism. What would a united church look like with a different form for the papacy. Bartholomew suggested that for the Eastern and Western churches to heal their millennium of division, it would be essential that the Petrine ministry, the papacy, be balanced by a rediscovery of synodality in the West. In 2008. Quote, it is well known that the Orthodox Church attaches to the synodical system fundamental ecclesiological importance. Together with primacy, synodality constitutes the backbone of the Church's government and organization. This interdependence between synodality and primacy runs through all levels of the Church's life, local, regional, and universal. Apparently, Pope Francis is interested in the patriarch's suggestion. In a 2015 address marking the 50th anniversary of the reestablishment of the Synod, Pope Francis reminded us that the only authority in the church is the authority of service. The Pope, he said, is not above the church. He is a member of the church. A baptized person among the baptized and a bishop among the bishops. As successor of Peter, he presides in love over the whole church. He also made it clear that the synod is with Peter and under Peter, not to dictate, 
but to guarantee unity. That sounds to me like seeking a balance between synodality and primacy. Striving to make the church walk together on a path of renewal is a big enough challenge for anyone, for any pope. Francis has certainly worked to fulfill the mandate of the cardinals who elected him to reform the Roman Curia, consistent with the principles he enunciated from the beginning of his papacy he has created the structure for a curia in the service of the local churches and focused on mission over maintenance. The document reforming the curia is called Predicate Evangelium, Preach the Gospel, and the Dicastery for Evangelization has the highest ranking in this new organization. Lay people, including women, can be in positions of leadership. But like his predecessor, Pope John XXIII, who 60 years ago today addressed an encyclical Pachamenteris to the whole world, inviting everyone to work together for peace, Francis sees the church's mission as much more external than internal. He wants the church to lead the whole world in recognizing that we are all part of God's family and that we have to live as sisters and brothers with all people and with all creation. This first Jesuit pope has shown the world that his selection of the name Francis was more than symbolic. While he certainly brings his Ignatian spirituality and charism for discernment to his exercise of the patron office, he also embodies the spirit of the poor man of Assisi for the 21st century. Intentionally or not, the joy of the gospel contains a missiology very consistent with the 13th century saint who was happy to be God's troubadour and whose gospel simplicity and authenticity was lived with contagious joy. Mission for St. Francis and for Pope Francis begins with an encounter with the all-merciful God which sparks an overflowing love, an overflowing joy that one is compelled to share. That is mission. When Pope Francis challenged the church early in his pontificate to stop looking like Lent without Easter and to stop finger wagging and condemning as a way to spread the gospel, the precedent was found in his namesake. Like his patron saint, the Pope has preached and worked for peace throughout his pontificate and has acknowledged the ongoing violence that many fail to see. He speaks about the Third World War being fought piecemeal and he's not shied away from war zones in order to personally bring a message of peace. Francis is in line with all his recent predecessors as a force for peace among nations and eager to serve in mediation to bring peace about. Yet even here, there's a particular style, an imitation of Jesus and a vicinanza, a nearness, like the words of Pope John in that moonlight speech. Francis traveled to war-torn Iraq, the first pope to do so. He met with indigenous leaders in Canada who had been harmed by the church's ministers. And at 86 years old, Francis, in a wheelchair, traveled to Congo and to South Sudan as a messenger of peace and to demonstrate his solidarity with those who have suffered the ravages of war. To victims of war in the eastern part of Congo brought to him in Kinshasa, he said, quote, I am close to you. Your tears are my tears. Your pain is my pain. To every family that grieves or is displaced by the burning of villages and other war crimes, to the survivors of sexual violence, and to every injured child and adult, I say, I am with you. I want to bring you God's caress. He gazes upon you with tenderness and compassion. While the violent treat you as pawns, our Heavenly Father sees your dignity. And to each of you, he says, you are precious in my sight and honored, and I love you. Brothers and sisters, the church is and will always be on your side. God loves you. He has not forgotten you. But men and women should remember you too. We've all witnessed his tireless preoccupation with the invasion of Ukraine by Russia. 
trying to walk the diplomatic tightrope so that he might be able to serve as a negotiator for peace did not win him much support. He always tries to read the full situation in context, but he could not deny that Russia was the aggressor, and he even jeopardized advances in ecumenism with the Russian Orthodox by his harsh words about Patriarch Kirill's support of Putin's war. Every Sunday, he reminds the pilgrims in St. Peter's Square to pray for martyred Ukraine. And he broke down last, in last December's Marian devotion in the Piazza di Spagna on the Feast of the Immaculate Conception when offering a prayer. He told Our Lady that he was hoping to come to give thanks for peace in Ukraine, but instead he will have to keep on praying. He also prays for Russians many of whom have a distorted view of the war through no fault of their own, and many want to have a peaceful coexistence with Ukraine. Even this past Good Friday, the Pope again used prayers for peace in the Via Crucis in Rome from Ukrainians and from Russians, despite the strong negative reaction from the Ukrainian church when he did so last year. Both sides are necessary to bring about peace. It was on the vigil of the Feast of St. Francis in 2021 that the Pope signed his encyclical Fratelli Tutti at the tomb of the famous peacemaker whose writings gave name, rise to the name of the document. Together with the 2015 encyclical Laudato Si, this first Jesuit Pope in history has given the global church a very healthy dose of Franciscan spirituality. He highlights the interrelationship of all creation and the need to live as brothers and sisters in fraternity with all humanity and indeed of all creation. Written in the midst of the global coronavirus pandemic in Fratelli Tutti, Francis laments how humanity failed to come together to address this common threat. And he urges humanity to start building the friendships and relationships that will be needed to avoid resorting to war and violence and now to work together to address the accelerating climate catastrophe. Just as the human family and all creation are interrelated, so are all the issues that threaten human existence, human dignity, and human life today. Climate change disproportionately affects the poorer countries of the world who consume less of the fossil fuels which have caused the warming. The loss of islands, the destruction of land and biodiversity, the unusual and brutal weather patterns all lead to greater migration, even as the wealthier nations close their doors to the suffering migrants trying to preserve their lives. All of this is a form of violence. Why should the Pope be the only one who sees the unsustainability of the present situation? Are we so unaccustomed to having prophets arise from within the church's hierarchy? Are human beings today so suspicious of any kind of organization that the common good becomes unthinkable? What will it take for all of the leadership of the church and of other world religions to speak as forcefully about the need for structural change and allow human values to supersede economic values for the common good and the common survival of all. Dialogue and friendship are introduced as a part of the path to a more fraternal world. Francis describes dialogue as approaching, speaking, looking at, listening, coming to know, understanding, and finding common ground. Dialogue is not the exchange of opinions, but a desire to come together. Selfish indifference or violent protest can undermine or end dialogue. Dialogue requires clear thinking, rational argument, a variety of perspectives, and the contribution of different fields of knowledge and points of view. It doesn't result in relativism, but is rather a search for the truth. Respect for the dignity of the other and the recognition that persons are more valuable than material things or ideas is necessary for dialogue that contributes to the common good. Pope Francis, in the spirit of St. John XXIII, has been about opening windows of the church to allow a fresh breeze in. 
Like John the 23rd, there has been considerable resistance in opposition to what he's imagining. And it's far more blatant than it was for his predecessor. But Francis, like the council which forms his ecclesiology, is interested in a church in service of the world, filling that world with the gospel in deed as much as in word. The embrace of synodality has the potential to revive and enliven the church under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And this church will strive to lead humanity to greater fraternity and unity for our survival and hopefully for our flourishing. This annual lecture honors Cardinal Joseph Bernadine, the late Archbishop of Chicago, who worked for the common good inside and outside the church. Forever known for the seamless garment approach to all the dignity of human life issues, he didn't always see success in his efforts for unity. He would be pleased to see Pope Francis endorse the concept of interrelatedness of all the life issues. And I'm sure Cardinal Bernadine would have enthusiastically engaged the synodal process with all of the hope it offers for a church that is faithful and engaged as a servant of the human family. Let's pray for the success of the Synod, pray for the success of the pontificate of Pope Francis, and pray for the realization of that vision of a more fraternal and more peaceful world. Thank you. Well, the Pope's definition of synod, the traditional uh, understanding of synod is walking together. But we understand that to mean a process of engagement, a process of listening, which Pope Francis is expanding not just to the bishops of the church, but to all the people of God. But it's that process of listening so that we can walk together and discern what the Spirit is saying to the church. Katie has a mic too over there, so if anybody on that side of the room. I have about 20 on my phone from the Zoom world. Thank you. Um, hi, my hi. name is Casey. Um, one of the, you mentioned when you were talking about the synthesis documents that one of the fears expressed um, was this idea that young people would not want to per continue to participate in the church or what the future of the church would look like. Um, and. I was curious how you would reconcile with the fact that many young people feel willing to participate in the synod process, um, but feel a cynicism towards it. Right. Um, after what feels like a history of the USCCB and the institutional church not acknowledging um, or confronting the legitimate concerns um, or dangers to dignity felt by young people. Um, and attempts to, to express those. Um, and I'm curious how you reconcile with the church that will continually make comments of the importance of its young people and their participation um, while failing to acknowledge them and, and what, they pers what, what we feel are, are true threats to our, our dignity and our well-being, um, both within the church and outside of it. Casey, I think you are naming exactly the central issue that we face, especially the church in the United States. One of the things that was very interesting to me is to, to those who would say that these are uniquely American problems and that the United States is only 6% of the global church, is that these issues are coming up everywhere. There's a concern that while there's a desire to hand on the faith that we hear again and again from many generations, what people experience is an indifference. Um, from the young people or an irrelevance to the young people, uh, from the part of the young people. And unless we actually engage, and I think this is what the Holy Father is trying to do, 
Why, when he called a synod for youth, specifically in Rome, did he go out of his way to make sure that they weren't just the participants in youth groups and everybody who's already teaching catechism and doing all the church things already, but went out of his way to include those who are alienated, those who are atheists, those who are non-professing, so that they could hear, so that he could hear particularly, the concerns of young people. I think the US church is behind in doing that, and we have to do a better job of hearing what it is not that we reshape the church to accommodate what everybody's needs are. That's the position that those who would undermine this process are saying, right? That you can't just destroy the tradition and restart to cater to everybody's needs. No, it starts with, first of all, recognizing the human dignity of all the children of God. Secondly, taking their experience seriously, recognizing there's a basic hunger for faith in all people. We're born with it, we're created with it, and how do we bring that out? instead of saying, if you don't follow the rules, then you're not part of us, right? But unless we can collectively really engage that process and listen to young people, right? And young people also have to listen. We're, they're not the, the owners of the tradition, right? They're part of it. So we have to broaden our understanding of how tradition is handed on, right? Because each generation contributes to that tradition, but it doesn't reinvent the tradition for itself. Right? But we have to take seriously the concerns of young people. And if we have a church that seems much more exclusive and either you do it this way or you're out, well, people are showing us that they'd rather be out. And that's a loss. And that's not Christ's desire for the church. Thanks so much, Bishop Stowe. Thanks, thanks, thank you. Uh, my name's Jack. I'm a PhD student in theology here, so my question might betray that bias. But I'm wondering um, what you what you would say the role of theology is in this synodal process um, between, and when I say theology, I mean that broadly. Sure, the theology sure. Pastoral questions. Um, how do you see that both in and out of the academy interacting with the Excellent. process? Excellent. Yeah, I, well, I think we start with a theology of church that recognizes that the people of God have something to say. right? And Pope Francis talks about the received tradition. He talks about the... Uh, uh, the faith as it is received by people being also unerring, right? So we have to take seriously the experience of people, and then we have to have the ways to reflect upon what's being heard and put that into dialogue with the scripture and tradition, our permanent sources, right, for the life of the church, permanent sources of revelation. So we'll need the academic theologians and the pastoral theologians to, to hear everything that's being said, reflect upon it, and then, as Pope Francis does in his exhortations, is to see how it fits with the tradition and where we have to keep on discerning, where we have to keep on talking. So I think the role of theology is gonna be an open-ended role, just like this whole process is going back and forth. I think what's key is to, to hear what Pope Francis says, is we don't have ready-made answers for every situation that we haven't faced before. So we have to wrestle with some things. And we can always go back to St. Anselm's classic definition of faith-seeking understanding. What are we trying to do in the 21st century? Make sense of this life-giving message so that it's truly life-giving, so that it's truly good news for the people of today. Thank you. In, in North America, there is this sort of um, tradition of separation of church and state. Mm -hmm. This is part of our sort of history in, in the United States. Um, I do believe Pope Francis has given us a call to action world over, not just the United States, in terms of clim the climate crisis, but poverty, capitalism, everything facing the social fabric of society. In, in the synodal process, I'm curious, or I'm also just generally curious about what the Pope may have said that I'm not an expert in, in terms of this sort of separation of church and state and how we understand the church and our political systems that are ultimately partially responsible for how we address these things facing mm -hmm. our, our facing mm -hmm. humanity. Mm -hmm. Things that the church tries to remedy, of course, in its own mission work. Um, I'm curious how we navigate as part of what ultimately is a democratic kind of um, process of synodality. Um, this notion of separation of church and state. The, the Catholic Church, or the Catholic vote is traditionally, this might be an outdated statistic, but they don't quote me, but 50-50 <laughs> in the United States. 
So I'm curious if that came up as part of all of this synthesis about how people, where people land, what the Pope can say to influence, how, how um, priests and church leaders can also call upon in, from, you know, to the people in the pews on Sunday, um, carry forth that call to action that Pope Francis himself has been bringing forward. Thank great, you. great question. Um, I think the key to the answer to that question is in chapter five of Fratelli Tutti, where the Pope talks about the nobility of politics, right? Politics has a bad connotation for us. And usually when we have a negative connotation about politics, it's because we're thinking partisan politics rather than politics, right? So in our tradition, our Catholic tradition, we believe that we have a responsibility to take part in politics. In fact, the Second Vatican Council would say that's the role of the laity, to be the leaven in the life of the world. And we do that politically because what's the alternative? Might makes right, do it through violence, right? When you talk about the United States tradition of separation of church and state, we sometimes exaggerate that because what the US Constitution says is that the state will make no uh, will establish no particular religion, nor will it in inflict or get in the way of the exercise of religion, right? So that gives us a lot more leeway. What it doesn't allow us to do is engage in partisan politics. And I think we've seen too much of that when the focus has been exclusively on the abortion issue to the exclusion of many others. And that has led us into a practically partisan approach to too much of the politics in the United States. That's not going to work when it comes to global and climate change or any of the issues that we're talking about. But if we read Fratelli Tutti, if we read what the Pope is saying in synodality, it's about finding the common ground, which we're going to have to do through the hard work of engaging conversations, forming relationships, listening to the voice of the poor. That's something that go to the peripheries is something very important. Right? And so it's not just about doing what's uh, politically palatable in the United States, but it's about discerning what is my faith call me to do. And it's not about the particular party that I belong to, but what do the policies have to say about preserving the natural resources, making sure that all people have access to those natural resources, making sure that we take action while we can to do what we can to preserve the planet. Those are all things that there is no prohibition from the Constitution for engaging in those things. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. It's an excellent question, and a simple answer won't suffice. But, but in a nutshell, that's it. Thank you, Bishop. This is from uh, our control room. Uh, if you could repeat the question, you have the hot mic for the Zoom tab. OK. You can abbreviate it. Okay. So I have one here from our friends on Zoom. Then we'll okay, here. sorry about that. No problem. No, this, this is you didn't know. So um, here's a question here. How do you, this is from Zoom. How do you see the relationship between discipleship, uh, following a teacher, and accompaniment, going to the margins in this noble process? Okay, so the, the relationship between discipleship, which is following a teacher, and accompaniment, which includes going to the margins. Well, I think those two things come together if Christ is the teacher. Right? Because Christ teaches us that model of accompaniment. The way that Christ reached out to people and the way that Christ taught people was first and foremost meeting them where they were and then calling them forth to something greater. So we can teach and then at the same time if we recognize that people are not living the fullness of our teaching, how do we walk with them and help them to move in that direction? That's I think what Pope Francis has been telling us again and again. It's not you cut people off because they're not there. It's not that we exclude people because they're not living the fullness of the teaching, but how do we walk with them to help them get closer to the fullness of the teaching? Because which one of us lives it entirely and fully in every aspect of our lives?
Okay, so the question is rather direct about reparation for the church's involvement in the transatlantic slave trade, and specifically, when are we going to see a check? Who, who would that check be made to? Well, sure. Okay, then you got the response you expected. I, I think it's tragic that we are so late to recognize our role in this. It's very recent that we have religious communities acknowledging their role in the slave trade, the church acknowledging its role in that, and the systemic suffering that has been a consequence of that, right? I think there's open debate about whether reparations is the way to go, and a, certainly a case can be made for restorative justice that it is the way to go. How do you make that happen? I, I don't have the answer for that. Sorry. Start by returning looted goods from Africa. Well, I would agree with that. Thank you. Uh, thanks, sir. The question about theology earlier uh, reminded me about something you said earlier in your speech about how some vocal voices in the church express, express skepticism uh, mm -hmm. of the synod changing theology or doctrine, um, or even perhaps just the handing down of the faith to younger people will, might change the doctrine or, or theology. What would you say to people who express those views? Um, and do you think the doctrine like should or will change based on the synod? Okay, so the question is basically about the synod and uh, the critics who are afraid it's going to change the doctrine or theology, and what would I say to those, and should it change uh, theology or doctrine? Uh, first of all, I think we have to separate the two concepts of theology and doctrine. And theology should always be changing, should always be adapting. What we talk about is doctrine as fixed belief, that's much slower to change and much rarer to change. I think it's more about how do we understand in the present age how we believe and why we believe what we believe. So if we take listening seriously, which the Synod says we have to do, then there's going to have to be some change in theology. Whether there's change in doctrine, we'll talk about change in theology, change in discipline, which is different than doctrine or the higher level of dogma. Okay, so an example, we're not going to add a person to the Trinity or take a person away from the Trinity, right? We're not likely to talk about now there's three natures of Jesus instead of just the human and the divine. Those are the things that are pretty fixed, the things that we recite in the creed, right? But how we live that out on a daily basis, how we understand people whose lives do not reflect what the church teaches at this moment in terms of sexuality, in terms of marriage, in terms of... Uh, their development as a human person, those are things that, that theology has changed, has evolved over the ages, and will certainly continue to do so. Some resist that, right? And that's where we get stuck. I think we have time for one more, but I, I just want to do some, some Zoom. Uh, oh, actually, you, yeah, please. Just go, a quick one. Go right ahead. <laughs> please, no, please. Um, well, my question would be, in, um, you mentioned about women leadership and how uh, much the real issue of women's ordination in the church is shared amongst the synod. Process. Participants, yes. Pardon me? The synod participants, yes. Yes. How, how, how big of an issue is this? Oh, how big is it? very important. Yes, it is very important, and it's coming up. Uh, so the question is about the women's issues, and particularly women's ordination. How much does that come up in the synod discussion? It's yeah, coming up. Think of it when you were talking about the Eastern Church, and you know, joining that up. You know, kind of. Well, go ahead. No, so it's come up from all over the world, right? And it seems that we're a lot closer in terms of, but we're not there yet. But we're a lot closer in terms of the ordination of women to the diaconate because at least there's a historical precedent for it in a church that values tradition, and the Eastern churches recognize that historical precedent. So that's, that's one piece. Um, going back to the previous question about the relationship of theology and doctrine, that's actually a, a, an issue of debate in the church right now. Is it a belief that we cannot ordain women? Is it a matter that has been instituted by Christ, as St. John Paul II said, 
or is it something that the church has the power to change? That's a question that's not going to go away. But that's all I can say about it at this point. It's, it's not going away. Thank you. Um, I'm going to stand up here. Just, I want to rehearse some. Pardon me, so Bishop, just so the mic can hear me. I just want to give you a couple insights from our Zoom. So, and, and these are just without responses, just so we can hear what's out there. Uh, how do we dismiss the reality of the American church leadership aligned with special interests, as detailed in a recent book? That's um, one question. How would the Synod support women religious under the, the uh, quote, diocesan rights aspect facing intimidation by the diocesan leaders who should encourage and collaborate with them? And a couple other questions. Uh, um, what will the U.S. Church learn from summaries from emerging nations in their synodal process? And then how do we regular folk um, best inhabit our roles in this process? So those are four um, items from the Zoomcast. Let's do one more in person, and then we have a special gift to give to Bishop Stowe. And I see you, Matthew. Um, you get the last word, my friend. Okay, so Matthew's asking uh, again on the cynicism, especially from young people and reading a lot on social media that raises some cynicism about whether anything can change and whether anything is going to change. And if the position is that the synod can't change doctrine, then um, isn't it going to be disappointing to a, a lot of people or what has to come forth from the synod? I think first of all is we're learning what the process of synodality is about. Right? So it's not an instant solution to our problems. And that's going to be frustrating for those of us who are impatient and have a pragmatic bent and just want to see things fixed right here and now. Again, if we think about the church in the United States being only 6% of global membership, and one of the questions that came from Zoom about what are we learning from the developing churches, you know, places where survival, you know, having enough food to eat, or our island is underwater because of global warming, those issues are a lot more pressing than some of the more theoretical issues. Not that they're unimportant, but they're a lot more pressing. From our North American perspective, I think we're going to have to be more patient if we want something positive to come out of this. But Pope Francis is not going to say, no, we can't do that. Even like he did with the Amazon Synod, he said, the time is not ripe. Let's go back and work through this some more so that we can have a genuine dialogue and actually be open to hearing another's perspective. And that's hard work that we're not used to. So will there be some disappointment? Yes. If we think there's going to be quick solutions, I'm sorry to say there's not going to be a quick fix. But I take a lot of hope from the enthusiasm that people who actually participated in the system felt about saying what they had to say. And the, partic the sessions that I participated in, even when people were at great odds with each other, they could recognize a love for the church from both sides. And that's that's progress, right? And then what's going to happen is that when we're talking about doctrine and dogma, who's going to make the decisions about how we proceed? And if Pope Francis is broadening the inclusivity of who's part of that discernment, I think that's very hopeful. You referenced in our dinner beforehand, we had a nice dinner with students at Bishop So, an experience in Kentucky with immigrants and people who were maybe not as welcoming as they might be. And something changed in the in the discussion, um, and I, that was very heartwarming. I think that's what you're kind of getting at as a as a possibility of dialogue. Sure, I think we, we can see the fruits of dialogue when we actually have face to face encounters. You know, I like early on in the joy of the gospel, Pope Francis says you can't have a, an encounter with a device with an on and off switch. 
right? It, it's got to be something that you get into a face-to-face -face discussion. And when you hear another person's story, so the, the example that Michael's referring to is a group that was fairly strongly anti-immigrant sitting down at the table and hearing the stories of people who crossed the border, who risked their lives to come from Central America, and were moved to tears by the experience that they heard. Sister Norma Pimentel tells stories like that at, uh, you know, in Brownsville at the shelter there, where people who have really hardened ideas when they're thinking about immigrants as statistics and numbers, and then meet the actual human beings and have a change of heart. So that's where the, the possibility for hope of change comes about. Beautiful. Um, Sister Norma, Norma is a saint, as we know, and she's also a Loyola graduate. So that's <laughs> um, I'd like to invite uh, Father Richie Salmia, um, who's the director of our Jesuit community, a special gift for the common good close to the home. Bishop Stowe, we're so happy to have you with us. Um, the bishop is staying with us as a guest at the Jesuit residence. And uh, this morning I had the 7.30 mass and I walked in and who was in the congregation and I didn't have a homily prepared. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably good anyway. <laughs> but it was great to pray with you this morning. Um, we know that Pax Christi USA is a special place in your heart as president of the organization. And on behalf of the Jesuit community, we want you to know that we have made a, a donation on your behalf to Pax Christi USA. Thank you, Thank you so much for being with us.